Hello, welcome to Baltic World, the premier channel discussing news and important issues facing Northern, Central and Eastern Europe. My name is Chris Byrne, and today I'm going to discuss a new visit that the foreign ministers of each of the Baltic countries have just made to the United Kingdom, hosted by their foreign secretary, Liz Truss. Uh, the UK and the Baltic states have released a joint communique that is both lengthy and thorough, I think it's worth going through the whole thing together and then discussing each of the paragraphs in their broader context. Uh, the first paragraph is a lot of congratulations about the end of the Soviet occupation, celebrating those 30 years uh, of freedom and democracy, 100 years of joint uh, relations between the UK and each of the Baltic countries. But then the second paragraph is when the rubber hits the road. And I'll read it out. It says... Ministers discussed matters of regional and international affairs, including relations with Russia and China. Ahead of the upcoming NATO foreign affairs minister in Riga, which I think is in December, we'll definitely cover it, they reaffirmed the role of NATO as the cornerstone of Euro-Atlantic security and agreed to work together to strengthen the alliance against existing and evolving threats. Ministers discussed security cooperation in the Baltic region, including the UK military presence within NATO's enhanced forward presence, and through the Joint Expeditionary Force, as well as through military exercises and air policing. The importance of transatlantic unity was emphasised. Ministers agreed to cooperate closely in multilateral fora and on holding Russia and China to their international obligations, uh, including on human rights. They emphasised the need to remain principled on our shared values in the face of systemic challenges posed by China. It's interesting. All agreed to continue building our collective resilience against Russian malign hostile activity to protect our national security interests and those of our allies and calling on Russia to uphold its international human rights obligations. Ministers recognize the continued need to engage with all partners on common challenges such as climate change. Okay, so two things really stand out at me there. The first is just explaining the UK's current role in the Joint Expeditionary Force. They have, I think, about 800 troops from the 20th Armour Brigade uh, rotating through Estonia. And that, uh, as along with other NATO countries, is there as a sort of tripwire response against any potential Russian aggression. And it acts as a deterrent because if Russia was to, let's say, invade the Baltic countries, then uh, not only would they be faced with the immediate resistance of those militaries, but also um, be challenging the, the might of other NATO countries as well, potentially acting as a rapid response for the rest of the countries to enter the conflict, in this case, the United Kingdom. Now, I am a strong proponent of ramping that up as much as possible, and there might be scope to do that, particularly in the case of the UK. I think the UK is the most likely candidate to increase its military presence and leadership in the Baltic countries other than the United States itself uh, and I'll explain why in a bit. The other thing that really jumps out at me is the references and the specific reference to China. China is not an immediate military threat to the Baltic countries or to the UK for that matter. Uh, however, it is clear that Lithuania has stood up in a very principled way to uh, Chinese aggression, CCP uh, intimidation of Lithuania has really galvanized support from a, a number of Western European countries, but not the least of being the United Kingdom. And also it, it creates this sort of pan anglospheric uh, viewpoint, extending it to the Baltic countries. And this is, this is quite interesting. I mean, the uh, Europe, the English-speaking world, um, particularly the, the big five, the UK, the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, have this really close familial relationship. And that is formalised in the Five Eyes intelligence relationship. And a number of other countries who have been close allies of the United States have looked at this from the outside and, and with a degree of envy and wanting to join. I think Japan being probably top of that list, looking at the close relationship that the Anglospheric countries have. Uh, the Baltic countries would potentially be able to kind of join that family in a sense that they are standing up on in a very principled way for values that we had historically associated with our own countries, rule of law, sovereignty, the individual, freedom of speech, human rights. And in fact, in some ways, they're exceeding us in those ways. Lithuania's highly principled stance contrasts to some of the things that are happening in some of our own countries, for example. So uh, there is that uh, deepening of relationship 
based upon shared identity that goes beyond uh, simple you know, alliance interests. And uh, that identity had historically been language, that being English, uh, but more than that, values. And I think the, of all the countries in the world outside of those five countries, uh, those countries that most embellish and embed those, those uh, values in themselves are the Baltic countries who have lived in, and suffered for decades under communist dictatorship and, and an external occupation and rule to, to be liberalised. They understand the dangers of those kind of Marxist ideas and therefore are pushed back against them most strongly. Things that during the Cold War, those in the West, uh, notably you know the UK and the United States, thought themselves to be the ones that embody it. If you think of the sort of the Reagan era of the 1980s, that tradition I think has now been inherited by the Baltic countries, and there is scope for potentially including the Baltic countries in these sorts of uh, you know joint intelligence relationships going forward. And, and they refer to that a little bit later in the communique. We'll, we'll go to that. Uh, and then the, the sort of global perspective of including China in that, this sort of uh, resisting dictatorship and authoritarian communist rule wherever it happens to be, even if it's not an immediate strategic threat to the countries involved, I think is quite a bold statement from the Baltic countries and the United Kingdom. And this also throws up interesting questions around the United Kingdom because now that they are no longer part of the European Union, the UK is t talking a lot about global Britain, they're never going to be able to project military power in East Asia against China in, in a significant way. In fact, the UK hasn't had a, a military presence in my region of the world uh, since 1967 where it withdrew all forces east of the Suez Canal. Uh, but, but... As the United States is being pulled deeper into uh, the Pacific to focus on its peer competitor, that being China, it's putting more and more pressure on the European countries to do more to deter Russia and to do more to protect Europe. Now, the country that is most responsive to that request would be the United Kingdom because that's the way they maintain their relationship with Washington. The UK has made much of its so-called special relationship with the United States uh, that it's enjoyed since the Second World War. Obviously, during the Cold War, the UK was America's strongest and most important ally in that uh, global struggle against the Soviet Union because of its geographic position in Western Europe. Well, now that China is the primary strategic adversary, the UK's strategic importance to the United States dramatically declines, except in one important respect. As the United States focuses on China, it needs a reliable ally to look after Europe, one that can step up as America pulls back and take on a leadership role. And the United Kingdom can do that, and if they do that, then they will maintain their influence in Washington and their access that they have uh, enjoyed for decades to technology, to the president, to you know have the, the Winston Churchill's bust in the Oval Office. Uh, so all of that is something that the United Kingdom would consider. The other thing to remember is that this is reminiscent of what happened during the Iraq War. The Iraq War was a obvious strategic error of the United States, a massive self-inflicted wound, the worst it had made in many decades. However, for American allies, those that backed the United States at that time, it was an unabashed success because uh, the UK got all kinds of special privileges out of the United States for backing the United States. Uh, Australia even more so in many respects, largely due to the deep personal relationship that existed between our Prime Minister John Howard and George W. Bush. So close, in fact, i got a funny anecdote, that when George Bush was finishing his second term of office, where uh, Barack Obama had been president-elect and they were working out the transition, well, the transition team, the new people that would occupy high White House positions, Barack Obama himself, they could not move in to the White House guest house, as was tradition, because uh, George W. Bush had his friend, the then former Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard, in that guest house because that's who he wanted to spend his final days in office with. So there's a great personal relationship between those two men. Uh, and so when the Americans went through that you're with us or against us period, you had Germany and France being implacable um, kind of foes of the Iraq conflict. 
and the Baltic countries supporting the United States gaining potentially the most benefit because America backed their entry into NATO, the, the greatest strategic coup that they could have ever imagined, if you look at what's happened to Ukraine and Georgia and other places, uh, and also the accession to the European Union, which happened in 2004 when the Iraq war was waging. Well, now that uh, the UK has kind of pulled back, the United States is focusing on another geostrategic challenge. Uh, the French are very upset with the US and Australia and the UK at the moment because of AUKUS. There is a strategic window of opportunity where, uh, because of the principled stance that the Baltic countries have taken in relation to China, they can continue to elevate their strategic relevance for the United States and the United Kingdom and build their ties with those countries. And I think it's sort of reflected here by mentioning. China directly. Next paragraph, uh, it says, On Belarus, the UK underlined its solidarity with Lithuania and Latvia in the face of Lukashenko's recent hybrid operation of irregular migrant flows across the EU border in order to pressure Belarus's European neighbours. This harmful, aggressive and exploitative behaviour must stop. All express concern at the systemic violation of human rights and fundamental freedoms in Belarus and agreed to work together and collectively in multilateral fora to encourage the regime to release political prisoners and engage in meaningful dialogue with the opposition leading to free and fair elections. Ministers reiterate their support for the efforts of the Belarusian people as they seek a more democratic future. Uh, absolutely. I don't have that much to add to that. Of course, uh, in just a space of a few months, uh, there have been more migrants flowing across the Belarusian-Lithuanian border than had been the case in the previous five or six years. Uh, Lukashenko had been flying in uh, irregular migrants from uh, Turkey to basically dump them on the EU border as a way of uh, pressuring the EU into lifting sanctions. Uh, this follows on from other things that Belarus has been doing, the, the construction of the Astrofiat power plant right on the Belarusian Lithuanian border. Uh, Lithuania, I think, has recently confirmed that no power from the Belarusian power grid is entering the EU at the moment. So it is trying to ring fence that off and make sure that uh, Eastern Europe doesn't become reliant on any kind of power production from Belarus uh, and, and a range of other things as well. I mean, the, the fact that Lukashenko uh, is kind of on the outs even with Putin, it's, it puts the Russians in a strange position where uh, Belarus, I believe, shut down Russian media that was operating in Belarus, much to the outrage of the Russian government. Uh, so he's not exactly the model acolyte of uh, the Vladimir Putin. However, Vladimir Putin doesn't really have anyone else to replace him with uh, because uh, everyone else wants free and fair elections and the aspirations of the Belarusian people. Uh, and it's good that the UK and the Baltic states are not letting up on this. The, the Lithuanians, of course, hosting the government in exile from Belarus and allowing uh, exiles to get safe haven in other places. I also remember what happened with the um, uh, Olympic Games with that runner who was, was marched to the uh, airport, had to beg for uh, asylum from the local Japanese. The Japanese are not particularly big on uh, granting asylum to anybody. They're very kind of strict on those sorts of things, but they did in this case. Uh, and they managed to get her out into Poland and her husband managed to escape to Ukraine. I believe they're together now. So a lot of terrible things are happening in Belarus. And uh, the Belarusians, yeah, it's a complicated place. Multiple religions, multiple ethnicities. It's not clear where things would end up. But while everyone's kind of got their claws in it, Lukashenko is, is you know, abusing the rest of Europe, uh, then there isn't much hope for the Belarusian people. So Lukashenko is getting old. He needs to transition out and there needs to be free and fair elections and, and liberal democracy in Belarus. And I think ultimately it probably will happen. Uh, it doesn't, it, it has to happen in, in a way that, you know, and, and I've said this in previous videos, that uh, doesn't provoke the Russians to intervene directly. We, we can't have... Bel like when the Belarusians look at uh, what could be, they look at the Baltic countries. But when they look at what they're afraid of, they look at Ukraine. And, uh, and if they you know, seem to be moving too far into the Western orbit, uh, then they could trigger some kind of military intervention by the Russians, and that would be just absolutely catastrophic. So uh, there, there needs to be dialogue with uh, Lukashenko for him to you know, have a meaningful discussion with the opposition, understand 
you know, where things need to go in Belarus. What does Belarus look like in five years? I mean, Lukashenko, you know, it's hard to see him being a constructive part of that future. So, uh, no, I think that this makes sense. And, and it's pretty much what the entire EU is saying. And in fact, what the, um, uh, the EU, uh, it is actually one positive example of EU solidarity. It does look like more or less the entire European Union has lined up with the Baltic states, with, with Poland, Lithuania, with Latvia, uh, in terms of calling for a transition with Belarus and freezing all kinds of uh, partnerships and Eastern dialogues with Belarus until such reforms take place. But right now it's in deep freeze and, and I'm worried about this future, but we'll continue to follow it closely. Uh, next paragraph. Ministers also reiterated their unwavering commitment to Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. They reaffirmed their support to Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic integration and the ongoing reform process. Uh, next paragraph, ministers agreed to work together on media freedom and combating disinformation. Now, I this phrase, I'll come back to that. They also agreed to work on cyber governments, deterrence, telecoms diversification, and strengthening the resilience of supply chains. They stress the need to promote the rules-based international order in cyberspace as well as to respond to and deter malicious cyber activities. A few things to say about this. The first, I always find media freedom and combating disinformation potential contradictions in terms. Yes, you know, a flood of misinformation, abusing algorithms, exploiting things for political gain, you know, Russian disinformation and so forth is, is a danger. But I think it's massively overblown. And, and I say this uh, truly because if we think about what happened with the 2016 election, uh, President Trump, like him or hate him, he won fair and square. He didn't win because of Russian propaganda. Uh, you know, many investigations, tens of millions of dollars, the Mueller, FBI, they all looked into it. Nothing was ever found. Uh, the level of misinformation occurring was at a very small, sporadic scale. Russia just isn't that powerful as to completely reshape American politics. Uh, and so media freedom is probably the best way to combat uh, disinformation, that is to have many voices speak, uh, and, uh, and then people can make up their own judgments. What we don't want is too much censorship is what I'm saying, that, that if you start to have you know, so-called fact-checkers, people with their own agendas trying to control the discourse, exclude certain people. I mean, I remember certainly what happened with the last election and a major, a certain New York Post story, the oldest uh, newspaper in the United States founded by Alexander Hamilton, a major story, which was true, was suppressed by major American uh, social media companies, Twitter, Facebook, and the like. So uh, I am cautious about this issue, um, just as a general thing. But when it comes to cyber governments, deterrence, uh, cooperation in, in cyber activities, that is, the I think, the great promise for uh, the Baltic countries in the UK dealing with China as well, because uh, while they can't project military power, significant military power in East Asia, they can cooperate with the United States and Australia and others in the cyber realm directly. And Australia also released a video, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, celebrating 100 years of relations with Estonia. Uh, this, this issue came up a lot, partnership in cyberspace, the digital economy, but also cybersecurity uh, and cyber conflict, uh, artificial intelligence systems and so on. Uh, the, if you think of what the technological entrepreneurship that exists in the Baltic countries, along with the kind of very high level skill set that exists in the major uh, tertiary institutions, Oxford, Cambridge in the United Kingdom, along with the United States and Australia, th there is a lot of scope for deepening cooperation between all of our countries in this space. I think that is an undersold issue. And I think also in, in AUKUS, when you look at the joint communique uh, announcing the nuclear submarine deal and all of that, well, all of the emphasis went on the submarines. But uh, a much more practical involvement of the United Kingdom in that arrangement is in the cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, autonomous uh, systems realm. And I think that, uh, that the Baltic states can be a major, if not integral part of that relationship. Um, and the rest is sort of, uh, you know, ministers agreed to forge ahead on ambition on climate change. Uh, and agree, ministers agreed, and, and this is another point, ministers agreed to identify opportunities to build closer economic ties between the UK and the Baltic region as a whole and get that high-speed rail up 
uh, and to increase the levels of trade and investment, including through technology partnerships and in key sectors, including cyber and the digital economy, life sciences, research and development, technology, defense, uh, energy and infrastructure. In particular, ministers agreed to explore the possibilities of collaboration on green tech, carbon capture, smart cities and green hydrogen. The ministers welcomed their countries participating in the North uh, the Northern Science Ministerial later in October. So a very positive joint communique, sketching all the major challenges of the world, China, Russia, Belarus, and so forth. I do foresee a deepening relationship between UK and the Baltic countries, and this will be something that the UK can do on behalf of the United States to increase their leverage in Washington while the United States is focused in East Asia on the China challenge, uh, and the Baltic countries could... Uh, potentially uh, enjoy a significantly upgraded level of military deployment from the UK. I'm sure there is a strong constituency in the UK pushing for this. Uh, and uh, hopefully that is what we see. So that's kind of my roundup of the joint communique and this important meeting. Uh, they do refer to the upcoming meeting in Riga in December. Rest assured, we'll cover it in detail. In the meantime, if you found value in this discussion, please like and subscribe. Consider sharing this video. And I will see you next time. Goodbye.